بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد My dear respected and beloved brothers and sisters in Islam First and foremost We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And we send as salatu wa salam upon our beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he make our actions and our sayings sincere for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a hadith reported by Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, found in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, وَمَجْتَمَعَ قَوْمٌ فِي بَيْتٍ مِّن بُيُوتِ اللَّهِ يَتْلُونَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَيَتَدَارَسُونَهُ بَيْنَهُمْ إلا نزلت عليهم السكينة وغشيتهم الرحمة وحفتهم الملائكة وذكرهم الله في من عنده. That a group of people do not gather in a house from the houses of Allah سبحانه وتعالى reciting the book of Allah سبحانه وتعالى and contemplating upon it except that Allah سبحانه وتعالى descends tranquility upon them and he covers them in his mercy and the angels surround them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them to those that are with him subhanallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives not just one but a number of rewards and a number of outcomes for those who gather for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the masajid to study and understand the Qur'an. And bi we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he make this majlis of ours, this gathering of ours from one of these gatherings bi Now, undoubtedly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he has revealed his words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it above any other kind of speech and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has challenged all of creation to come forth with something like the Quran in one of the ayat revealed in the Meccan period in the early time in Islam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Say that if all of mankind and all of jinn kind were to gather to come forth with something similar to the Qur'an, then they would not be able to do so. And furthermore, when the Arabs were befuddled and when the Arabs were not able to produce something similar to the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala further reduced this to ten surahs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَمْ يَقُولُونَ افْتَرَاهُ قُلْ فَأْتُوا بِحَشْرِ سُوَرٍ مِثْلِهِ That do they say that it is something invented by him, meaning invented by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So the response to that is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, say that produce ten surahs similar to it. Produce ten surahs similar to the Qur'an. And even yet, the Arabs were unable to do so. And furthermore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Again, in the early period in Islam, the Meccan period, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَمْ يَقُولُونَ افْتَرَهُ قُلْ فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِّثْلِهِ That do they say that it is something which is invented by him, come forth with a surah similar to it. And confirming this further, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, towards the end of uh, the prophetic period, in the Madani period, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِّمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِّثْلِهِ وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِّن دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا وَلَنْ تَفْعَلُوا فَاتَّقُوا النَّارِ That if you are in doubt regarding that which we have sent down to our slave, meaning to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then come forth with a surah similar to it. And come forth, come forward with your witnesses if indeed you are truthful. 
if indeed you are truthful. And if you are not able to do so, and you will never be able to do so, then fear the fire. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran challenges firstly the addresses to the Arabs, the people that were most equipped to actually address this challenge. However, the, the, the challenge goes to all of creation. The challenge goes to all of mankind. The challenge goes to even all of jinkind. As we have understood from the uh, ayat which were previously mentioned. And furthermore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not put any time limit to it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَن تَفَعَلُوا And you will never be able to do so. Imagine this a challenge which stands till the end of time, until the day of judgment. And not just that, people can help one another. People can help one another. So this challenge stands till the day of judgment. And it shows us the importance of studying and understanding this Qur'an and why the Arabs were unable to do so. Why it is in inimitable. Why the Qur'an is inimitable. Now from among the aspects of the in inimitability of the Qur'an is the structure of the Qur'an. We see that the Qur'an is structured in a way which is unlike any other book, which is unlike any other literature. And what I mean by structure is its coherence, the fact that it's, you know, it flows, it moves, you know, the parts are brought together in a way which is meaningful. The parts of the Qur'an are brought together in a way which is meaningful. And in a way which brings even further meaning through the sequence of the Qur'an. Now tonight, inshallah, this will be the point of discussion about how is the Qur'an structured in a unique way and how do we understand that this message is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the structure of the Qur'an. And by structure I mean, you know, a number of things. I mean, number one, the form of different parts of the Qur'an. What is the form? How does it look in and of itself? What is the position of the different parts of the Qur'an, whether we're talking about the surahs or whether we're talking about the ayahs or even further down the words and the letters. All of these things are unique and all of these things are meaningful. Now, we will try and look at it from different aspects, from different angles. Firstly, we will try and start off by looking at the Qur'an as a whole and how it is structured in a unique way. And secondly, we will look at the surahs in the Qur'an and how they are structured in a unique way and then furthermore we will look at the ayat and then even further down to the words of the Qur'an and how they are structured in a unique way. Now, the Qur'an as a whole is something which is structured in a unique way. And I will just mention one feature and I will mention features which we can reflect upon and we can understand uh, through reflecting upon these features. Now, one of the features that we see of the Qur'an as a whole, the features of the structure of the Qur'an as a whole, is that we find that the beginning, the opening of the Qur'an, and the closure of the Qur'an have a kind of relationship. And we see this to be not just in the, whole Qur the Qur'an as a whole, but we see this even in surahs within themselves. That the beginning, the opening, and the closure is something where there is a relationship. Similar to how we have in normal speech or a normal kind of uh, written document, we have an introduction and we have a conclusion. There is a relationship between the beginning and the end. So similarly, in the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we see that there is a relationship between the beginning of the Qur'an and the end of the Qur'an, between the beginning of the surahs and the end of the surahs. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in the Qur'an, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ That if you are to recite, if you are to read the Qur'an, then seek protection, seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from Satan the expelled. From Satan the expelled. And how do we apply this? We apply this by following how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would recite أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ prior to reciting the Qur'an. And this is, you know, this has a number of benefits 
it wards off the shaitan when a person is trying to recite the Quran. It wards off the shaitan from putting riya in his heart, from putting, you know, showing off in his heart. It takes away different kinds of diseases from his heart. Now, similarly, we find that when we start reciting the Quran, we find that we, we seek protection in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the shaitan. Similarly, when we finish the Quran, when the Quran has ended, at the end of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put two surahs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed two surahs at the end of the Quran, which are a protection after a person has finished reciting and doing a khatma of the Quran. And they are, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ and قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ A person seeks refuge from all of the different evils, including uh, you know, the shaitan and including other things, including hasad and including other things. So we find that there is a relationship between the way a person starts the Quran and the way a person ends the Quran. Now we will suffice for this, uh, with this for uh, one, of the uh, one of the features of the structure of the Quran as a whole. And we will move on to the features of uh, the structure of surahs or a number of surahs. And we find something similar within surahs. That we find that the opening and the closure, the beginning and the end, the introduction and the conclusion have a relationship and they are very similar. And that is why one of the great scholars of Islam, Jalaluddin al-Suyuti, rahimahullahu ta'ala, he wrote a book on this. He wrote a book wherein he discusses how each and every surah in the Qur'an, there is a relationship between the beginning and the end of the surah. How there is a relationship between the beginning and the end of the surah. Now from the examples is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in Surah Al-Mu'minun, at the beginning, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Indeed, the believers are successful. Indeed, the believers are successful. And right at the end of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends off by saying, إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الْكَافِرُونَ Indeed, the disbelievers will not be successful. So we find a clear relationship between the beginning and the end. It's as if there is one topic within the surah. At the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces it with قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ That indeed the believers are successful. And right at the end, after the topics have been discussed, which return back to this main topic and this main subject, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends this by saying, إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الْكَافِرُونَ That verily, the disbelievers will not be successful. Similarly, we find that at the, at the beginning of Surah An-Nahl, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَتَى أَمْرُ اللَّهِ فَلَا تَسْتَعْجِلُوهُ That the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has come. So, do not hasten it. Do not hasten it. So at the beginning of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibits a person from having haste. And we find that at the end of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the command of patience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاصْبِرْ وَمَا صَبْرُكَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ That be patient and your patience is not except through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning through the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says at the beginning of Surah Al-Anbiya, اِقْتَرَبَ لِلنَّاسِ حِسَابُهُمْ وَهُمْ فِي غَفْلَةٍ مُعْرِضُونَ That the account of the people has come close, has come close for them. So at the beginning of the Surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds of the nearness of the Day of Judgment and the nearness of the account, the account that a person will face on the Day of Judgment. And at the end of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاقْتَرَبَ الْوَعْدُ الْحَقِّ وَاقْتَرَبَ الْوَعْدُ الْحَقِّ That the true promise has come close. The true promise has come close. Now we'll move on uh, after this, and we'll discuss another feature of the structure of the Qur'an, inshallah. Another feature that we find in the Qur'an is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala digresses Within one topic, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala digresses to another topic. So, for example, I'll give you an example in normal speech. Let's say I'm describing Ahmed. And I say, Ahmed is tall. Ahmed is, uh, you know, good looking. Ahmed goes to the shops. Ahmed goes to school. I'm discussing Ahmed. And then in between, I say, respect your parents. And then I go back to 
Ahmed is, uh, you know, he is fast in running. Ahmed. So in between this topic which I'm discussing, in the middle, I have digressed onto something apparently, uh, you know, different to the topic that I'm discussing. Now in this manner, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at times is discussing a topic, is mentioning a topic, and in between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala digresses to another topic. And this is not meaningless. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does this for a meaning. And when a person ponders upon these meanings, a person will understand and a person will have even more understanding of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me give you an example. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned in a hadith, which is narrated by At-Tirmidhi and Ahmad. And it is, uh, you know, classed as authentic by a number of scholars, uh, such as uh, Imam al-Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala, and Imam ibn Hajar, rahimahullah, and others. Narrated by Ibn Umar, radiallahu anhuma, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ سَرَّهُ أَنْ يَنْظُرَ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ كَأَنَّهُ رَأْيَ عَيْنٍ فَلْيَقْرَأْ إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ وَإِذَا السَّمَاءُ فَطَرَتْ وَإِذَا السَّمَاءُ شَقَّتْ Whoever wishes to see the day of judgment as if he is seeing it with his eye, as if he is seeing it with his eye, then let him re read three surahs. Let him read three surahs. And these three surahs are إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ إِذَا السَّمَاءُ فَطَرَتْ and إِذَا السَّمَاءُ شَقَّتْ Now let me ask you, when we look at the Qur'an, you know, many of us have memorized Juz Amma, or we, we are at least aware of Juz Amma. Let me ask you, how are these three surahs arranged in the Qur'an? What is the sequence of these three surahs in the Qur'an? We find that there is one surah in between. This group of surahs which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned, or the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned, in between this, gr this group of surahs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned one surah. And that is, you know, the odd one out. You can say the odd one out. It comes after idha samaun fatarat, and it comes before idha samaun shakkat. Now one might ask, what is the reason for this? What is the purpose for this? If we look at this surah, and we analyze the beginning of this surah, one realizes and when one ponders upon this surah, one realizes why this surah has come in between. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, Wailu lil mutaffifin. Woe be to the mutaffifin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes to us who are the mutaffifin in the next few ayat. Alladheena idha kthalu ala al-nas yastawfoon. Alladheena idha kthalu ala al-nas yastawfoon. Wa idha kaluhum aw wazanuhum yukhsiroon. That they are those whom, when they take a measure from people, then they take it in full. They take it completely. This is talking about buying and selling. Buying and selling. That w basically when a person takes the price of the thing, when the seller takes the price of the thing, he takes the full cost of the thing. He takes the full cost of the thing. Let's say a person, this thing is to be sold for ten dollars or ten rials, then a person takes the full ten rials. But when a person is measuring something and giving it to that person, then a person puts it in loss. Puts it in loss. Meaning a person does some kind of deception where a person gives a bit less than the due. Uh, gives a bit less than the due. He gives a bit less than the person's right. So let's say he's supposed to give 10 kilograms, he gives 9 kilograms and he does some kind of a deception. So this kind of thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has condemned in this surah, in the beginning of this surah. And when one ponders upon this, a person realizes why has this surah come in between these three surahs. That is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has discussed Yawmul Qiyamah and about how it is as if it is in front of our eyes, as if we can see it in front of our eyes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving an indication here that a person will tr not truly understand what Yawm Al-Qiyamah is until a person gives up the dunya. Until a person doesn't have that love of the dunya to this extent where a person is willing to give up the akhirah even for a little portion of the dunya. Just for a little portion of the dunya a person is willing to give up the akhirah, this person does not understand what Yawm Al-Qiyamah is. 
This person, even if he is repeating what are the uh, descriptions of Yawm Al-Qiyamah, a person will not understand what Yawm Al-Qiyamah is. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says after that, وَإِذَا كَالُوهُمْ أَوْ وَزَنُوهُمْ يُخْسِرُونَ أَلَا يَظُنُّ أُولَٰئِكَ أَنَّهُمْ مَبْعُوثُونَ Do these people not think that they will be resurrected? So here connecting that action to Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Connecting that action to Iman in Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So here we understand the importance of action when a person believes in something. When a person believes in Yawm Al-Qiyamah, it's not just a claim. It's not just stating facts that this is going to happen on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, this is going to happen on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, this is going to happen on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. But rather it's about acting upon it. It's about believing in it, really believing in it. To the extent where a person acts in an appropriate way, acts accordingly. Just like, you know, normally if we are sitting, you know, at home, if we are to be sitting at home, and, you know, maybe someone in your house, your family member comes in, rushes into the room, and he says that, the, quick, quick, quickly, the house is on fire. And then you say, you sit back and you say, yes, I believe you. And you just sit there and don't do anything. Does this person really believe that person? If a person relaxes there, he doesn't hasten to call the, uh, you know, the emergency services or whatever it is, or to rush out of the building, then a person doesn't truly believe what that person is saying. Similarly, if a person does not act in accordance to his belief in Islam, then it is not real belief. It is not the true belief that is required of a person. Whether it be in Yawm Al-Qiyamah, whether it be in the angels, whether it be in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or otherwise. Now let us give another example of digression in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, حَافِظُوا عَلَى الصَّلَوَاتِ وَالصَّلَاةِ الْوُسْطَى وَقُومُوا لِلَّهِ قَانِتِينَ فَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ فَرِجَالًا أَوْ رُكْبَانًا فَإِذَا أَمِنْتُمْ فَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَمَا عَلَّمَكُمْ مَا لَمْ تَكُونُوا تَعْلَمُونَ He's talking in Surah Al-Baqarah. He's talking about the salah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that maintain with care or be persistent or safeguard the prayers and especially the middle prayer and stand up in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala devoutly in obedience devoutly and if you fear meaning if you're in the state of fear maybe you're in the state of war whatever it is then you can do it either on foot or you can even do it riding meaning riding an animal meaning you can perform your prayer even riding or uh, on an animal in this case فَإِذَا أَمِنْتُمْ فَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَمَا عَلَّمَكُمْ مَا لَمْ تَكُونُوا تَعْلَمُونَ And if you are to be secure again, then remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he taught you that which you did not previously know. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these two ayat, he is commanding humankind, he is commanding the Muslims to establish the salah, to safeguard it to the extent that even when a person is in fear, even when a person is in battle, he's not allowed to leave it, but you can give up certain you know, parts of it. Instead of doing it on foot, you can even do it riding in that case. So a person is required to perform the salah in any case, whether he is in sickness, whether he is in good health, whether he is in fear, basically perform the prayer, but in some situations, maybe some things are excused for you. Now, when we look at the ayat previous to this, prior to this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the relationship between the husband and the wife. Talking about nikah and talaq, talking about marriage and divorce and so on and so forth. And the ayat after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also talking about the relationship between the husband and the wife. وَالَّذِينَ يُتَوَفَّوْنَ مِنْكُمْ وَيَذَرُونَ أَزْوَاجًا وَصِيَةً لِأَزْوَاجِهِمْ مَتَاعًا إِلَى الْحَوْلِ غَيْرَ إِخْرَاجٍ What does a person, what does a woman do when the husband passes away? So the ayat prior to this and the, prior, the, ayah, the ayah after it is talking about the relationship between the husband and the wife. Again, the question arises, why is there these two ayat which are talking about preserving and safeguarding the salah 
in between these ayah talking about the relationship between the husband and the wife. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned to us, Ihfad Allah yahfadk. That safeguard Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he will safeguard you. That meaning safeguard the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he will safeguard your rights. And there are many other meanings that can be taken from this hadith, such as safeguard your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will safeguard his relationship with you. And from among the meanings that can be derived from this is that when a person safeguards their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by safeguarding those things where a person establishes that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and especially the salah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assists him in safeguarding his relationship with the creation. And most importantly, with the spouses. With the spouses. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned to us in Surah An-Nisa also. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَالصَّالِحَاتُ قَانِتَاتٌ حَافِظَاتٌ لِلْغَيْبِ بِمَا حَفِظَ اللَّهِ That the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing the righteous woman. He says, the righteous woman, فَالصَّالِحَاتُ قَانِتَات They are devout, they are devoutly obedient. Meaning either devoutly obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or devoutly obedient to their husbands. Qanitat, hafidhatul lil ghayb. They are, they preserve them in their absence. Meaning they preserve their husbands in their absence. They safeguard their husbands in their absence. Meaning when the husband is away, then she safeguards herself, she safeguards his property and so on and so forth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says after this, bima hafidhallah. Through the safeguarding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Due to the safeguarding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that, the righteous women are this way. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them that way. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguarded them. It is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is one thing that we need to remember. Whenever we face problems in our lives, whether it be you know, disputes between the husband and the wife, or whether it be other problems. What did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teach us? That كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا حزبه أمر فزع إلى الصلاة. That the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, whenever a matter would concern him, whenever a matter would trouble him, then he would rush to the salah. Today, what is our situation? That whenever we face problems, we make excuses for going to the salah. We make excuses for not going to the salah. You know, I have this excuse. I have this problem in my life right now. And what one person forgets is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has put these tests in your life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to come and ask help from Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to come and ask help from Him. Many a times we, we leave the salah to the last, to the end. The salah is the last thing that we turn to. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us in fact, he commanded Bani Israel before, before us, before this ummah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ That seek help through sabr, through patience, and through salah. And this is the command, this is the, the address to Bani Israel, the Jews. And later on in the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the same command to the believers. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ O oh, you who believe, seek help through patience and through salah. And this is something that we have, many a times we have overlooked this. That the place that we should really be seeking help from is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, when Musa alayhi salam and his followers were facing the trouble from Fir'aun and his people. And they were in such an you know, oppressed state. And the time for the victory from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was nearing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded them with one command. Not to go and, you know, try and fix their problems and to try and, you know, uh, you know uh, speak against the Fir'aun and do this and do that. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them one command. وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ مُوسَىٰ وَأَخِيهِ أَن تَبَوَّأَ لِقَوْمِكُمَا بِمِصْرَ بُيُوتًا وَجَعَلُوا بُيُوتَكُمْ قِبْلَةً وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةً 
وبشر المؤمنين that we revealed we inspired to Musa and his brother that they take and they prepare for themselves homes which they can take as a qibla which they can take for themselves as a place for prayers for their prayers and to establish the salah and to establish the salah when their state was like this when they were oppressed and we know that the Fir'aun you know the kind of things that the Fir'aun used to do to the Bani Israel were you know horrendous and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them one command salah, that establish the salah and give glad tidings to the mu'minin give glad tidings to the mu'minin and this was the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa so we should try and return to this way and especially when we have faced problems with our family we should remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can fix that problem when we face problems with, between the spouses between the husband and the wife we should remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who can fix this problem so hurry and rush to the salah and let it be something a, a source of comfort rather than a source of discomfort for us let it not be that we come to the salah and the Imam has read a bit longer than usual and we are saying to ourselves Ya Imam, O oh Imam, too long today, two minutes too long let this need not be our situation so let us try and find comfort in the Salah another example that we find is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before Ayatul Kursi before Ayatul Kursi, we all know Ayatul Kursi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu anfiqu mimma razaqnakum min qabli an yatiya yawmun la bay'un fihi wa la khullatun wa la shafa'ah wal kafirun hum al zalimun That oh you have believed spend from that which we have provided for you before there comes a day in which there is no exchange meaning no ransom and no friendship and no intercession and the disbelievers, they are the wrongdoers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah, He is commanding the believers to spend in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The subject of the ayat is spending in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, giving sadaqah. And right after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions ayatul kursi. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum. And these ayat are talking about the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, after these ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a number of ayat talking about belief in the Day of Judgment, strengthening belief in the Day of Judgment. And after around two pages, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returns back to that same topic. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ كَمَثَلِ حَبَّةٍ أَنْبَتَتْ سَبَعَ سَنَابِلَ فِي كُلِّ سُنْبُلَةٍ مِئَةُ حَبَّةٍ that the, the example of those who spend their wealth in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like a seed which grows seven years and by ears we mean you know the, the thing such as wheat and corn they grow in ears basically the, those little branches that come out and the grains grow through that so the example of those who give charity is like a person who puts a seed and that grows into seven ears seven ears seven of those those little branches you can say and in each ear is a hundred grains so from that one grain from that one seed how many grains have come out 700 so there were seven ears on, on each ear there was hundred grains so from that one seed from that one grain came 700, 700 grains and this is what the scholars have mentioned regarding this ayah that when a person spends in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiplies the charity 700 times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiplies the charity 700 times and Allah multiplies for whom he wills and Allah is all encompassing and knowing so again the topic has returned back to spending in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now in between these ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about basically iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and iman in the day of judgment, strengthening these two. One might ask, why is it that in between these ayat relating to sadaqah 
relating to charity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in iman in the day of judgment. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned to us in a hadith, as sadaqatu burhan. That sadaqa is a burhan. Sadaqa is a clear proof. Is a clear proof. Clear proof of what? The, the word burhan itself, it means clear proof. But originally in the language, what it means is the rays of the sun, which give evidence of the sun. Which give evidence of the sun and the light of the sun. That is originally what the word burhan means. But it has been used by the Arabs to mean an evidence. To mean a clear proof. Now, here, what is sadaqa a burhan of? What is sadaqa a clear proof of? Of the iman in a person's heart. Of the iman in a person's heart. That a person believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that a person believes in the day of judgment. Because ultimately, why does a person give sadaqa? They, you know, apparently, in most cases, there is no apparent worldly benefit from it. There's no apparent worldly benefit from giving sadaqah, spending in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But according to what we learn in the ayat and according to what we learn in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly informs us that we have benefits. There is benefits for sadaqah in this world and in the hereafter. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, within these ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthens a person's belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the day of judgment. Because essentially this is what a person requires to push him towards spending more in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For a person to understand that these are the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the day of judgment is coming. That a person is going to be accountable on the day of judgment. So this is something which encourages a person further to spend in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are a few examples of where we find digression in the Qur'an. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about a certain topic and in between that certain topic, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions something apparently unrelated to the topic, but it has some kind of meaning, some kind of benefit that a person can derive. Now, similarly, we can find that there is cohesion and there is, you know, there is a sequence between the surahs. There is a certain kind of meaning to the sequencing of the surahs. And this sequencing can be observed through the end of a surah and the beginning of a next surah. Or it can be observed in one surah as a whole and the other surah, the next surah as a whole. Let me give you an example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says at the end of surah An-Nahl, Inna Allah ma'al ladhina attaqaw wal ladhina hum muhsinun. That verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with those who fear him and those who are doers of good, those who do ihsan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with those people. And at the beginning of the next surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of the highest and the greatest of those who do ihsan. And the greatest of those who have attained taqwa. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was with him. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aided him. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him for the journey of Isra and Mi'raj at a time where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was going through you know, worldly suffering. And that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned at the beginning of the next surah. Subhan al-ladhi asra bi'abdihi laylam min al-masjid al-harami ila al-masjid al-aqsa. That glory be to the one who has taken his slave, meaning the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa. So here at the end of Surah Al-Nahl, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of what, how is his relationship with those who have taqwa and those who do ihsan. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with him. And in the beginning of the next surah, we find that there is this cohesion, there is this relationship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aided the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. An example, a common example, which was mentioned by one of the scholars of tafsir, uh, 
uh, Al-Biqari rahimahullah, and his tafsir, you know, he mentions, makes mention of the sequencing of the Qur'an and the coherence of the Qur'an. This was the main focus of his tafsir. He mentions that what is the relationship, what is the relationship between Surah Al-Fatiha and Surah Al-Baqarah. We find that there is a coherence. And that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us of a dua that we should ask in our salawat, in Surah Al-Fatiha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ To teach us this dua. We are asking guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ To the straight path. Now the beginning of the next surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers that dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us of what is the way to seek that guidance, what is the way to get that guidance. He says, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ This is a book about which there is no doubt. It is a guidance for the muttaqin. So look at the relationship, look at the coherence of the Qur'an. We find that there is, it, it, it connects, it connects. Similarly, we find that there are surahs as a whole, they have a relationship to another surah as a whole, to the next surah as a whole. So let me give you an example of this. We find that Surah An nur the central theme of that surah is, as the title of the surah shows, it is An nur It is An nur That it is talking about the light that is there in the hearts of the believers. The light that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts in the hearts of the believers through His grace. And what does light do? You know, the physical light, what does it do? When we shine it, if it's dark, we can see in front of us. We can see in front of us. And the next surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Al Furqan, Tabarak al Nazal Al Furqan, the differentiator. Because when a person you know, is able to see what is in front of him. He's able to observe what is in front of him for what it really is. Then a person is able to differentiate between what is right and what is wrong. So look at the logical sequencing of these surahs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first talks about a surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first makes mention of a surah which talks about light, which talks about something which will show things for what they really are. And the next surah which differentiates between the haqq and the batil, between the truth and the falsehood. Now, a final thing which we will make mention of is that within surahs, sometimes we find that they are connecting words which indicate to us what is the relationship between the ayat, what is the connection between the ayat. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions uh, أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَى الَّذِينَ يَزْعُمُونَ أَنَّهُمْ آمَنُوا بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ يُرِيدُونَ أَنْ يَتَحَاكَمُوا إِلَى الطَّاغُوتِ Have you not seen those who claim to have believed in what was revealed to you and what was revealed to those before you? They wish to refer legislation to Taghut. So these ayat are talking about people who uh, they claim that they following the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they claim that they believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yet when it comes to the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they do not follow that law, but rather they assign legislation to something else. They assign legislation to something else. Now after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala further discusses the qualities of these people. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ وَإِلَىٰ الرَّسُولُ That if they are called to that which has been revealed to, uh, you know, that which has been mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. And it's talking about how they reject and they turn away from the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now after this, after about one page, after, you know, towards the end of this page, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَا وَرَبِّكْ But no, and by Allah, uh, and by your Lord. But no. But what? You know, but normally is something which is connected to something before it. That we are referring to something which we made mention of already. 
But no, they will not truly believe. They will not truly believe. Look at what was mentioned before. Alam tara ila ladhina yaz'umuna annahum amanu bima unzila ilayka wa ma unzila min qablik. Do you not look, uh, do you not see those people who claim that they believe in what was revealed to you and what was revealed before you? So they claim to believe. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after about a page, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of the response to this. And that is understood by that letter there, fa. But it is, you know, connecting to something before it. So this is important to notice when we are reading the Qur'an. That there are certain connecting words which refer to something. And when we look back, we don't see it directly before it. And it helps us to understand the sequencing of the Qur'an. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يؤمنون. And know by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will not truly believe. Until they make you judge concerning that over which they dispute among themselves. Meaning that they will not truly believe until they make you the one who, you know, gives that legislation. They refer legislation back to you, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Regarding that, you know, regarding their disputes. And then find within themselves no discomfort. Meaning that even that legislation which is given by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after it is given, they follow it, but they do not just follow it, they find comfort within themselves to follow it, complete comfort within themselves. وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمَا And they submit to it in full. So look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the response to this. That a person should, when it comes to the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, given to us by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a person should completely submit, not even find a single you know, a single ounce of discomfort within themselves regarding the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and regarding the things which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has made mention of. Now let's move further and let's discuss two more aspects inshallah. One is the structure within an ayah. The structure of the Qur'an within an ayah. How it is structured and how this is something which is unique. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in some of the ayat, He makes, He puts some things which are supposed to be before, He puts them after. And some things which are supposed to be after in the sentence, He puts them before. From, from the examples of this, and we'll men make mention of this quickly, inshallah, because, you know, uh, there's a number of things to, to be mentioned, is, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ you we worship, you we worship, and you we seek help from. Normally in Arabic language, even similar to English language, we say, na'buduka, na'buduka. The normal sentence structure, as has been mentioned by the linguists, is we say na'buduka, that we worship you. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you we worship. And when this happens in the sentence, you know, even in English, it sounds strange. It sounds a bit strange. You, we worship, instead of we worship you. And in, in the Arabic language, again, it's the same thing. It's the same kind of concept. That there is a normal structure, but it has, you know, been turned around. The linguists, they explain that when things are turned around, there is a certain purpose behind this. There's always some kind of meaning which is derived from this. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ you we worship and you we seek help from. And the scholars of tafsir, they explain that this taqdeem, this mentioning of the thing which is supposed to be after, mentioning it before, gives the meaning of something called hasr. Gives the meaning of something called exclusivity. Meaning, exclusively you alone we worship. You alone we worship. Meaning no one else we worship. And you alone we seek help from. So, when we're saying you, it gives the meaning of exclusivity. That you exclusively and no one else we worship, and you exclusively, no one else we seek help from. And there are other meanings that can be derived from this taqdeem and this ta'khir, and we'll move on, inshallah, to the next point. Another thing which is found, another f feature which is found within an ayah, 
is we find that certain parts of the sentence are removed. Certain parts of the sentence are removed to give a certain meaning. From the examples of this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, la tuqaddimu bayna yaday Allahi wa rasoolih. O oh, you who believe, do not put in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. Now one might ask, even in English it sounds strange. Again, it sounds like something strange. Do not put in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. We would normally complete that with the object of the verb. That do not put in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger something or anything or whatever it is. You, you know, your parents or your friends or whatever it is. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has removed the object of the verb to give the meaning of generality. Meaning that anything can be put in that place. Anything can be put in that empty space. That do not put in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger anything. Do not put in front of them uh, your friends. Do not put in front of them your own opinion. Do not put in front of them uh, your parents' opinion. Do not put in front of them uh, anyone's opinion. Or whatever anyone says. Do not put in front of them anything. So this is the meaning that it gives. It gives the meaning of generality and there are other meanings which are derived from this removal of certain parts of the sentence, uh, removal of certain parts of the sentence. Now finally we will end with these two examples inshallah. The structure within a word. The Quran is such a book that not a single word and not a single letter even is out of position and has no meaning or no value to it. Every single letter is meaningful. Every single letter has some kind of purpose. And so we'll mention two examples of words which are structured in a certain way which are meaningful. Which are meaningful. One of the examples of this, and this is something which we mentioned before. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ كَمَثَلِ حَبَّةٍ أَنْبَتَتْ سَبَعَ سَنَابِلٍ we will not mention the whole ayah again, but basically we talked about the ears, the seven ears, the reward of the charity. So basically the seven ears, and in each ear there is hundred grains. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how charity is multiplied. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Saba sanabil. Seven ears. The translation of that is seven ears. And the word he has used to mention uh, the ears is sanabil which is a plural of sumbula, which is a plural of sumbula, which is ear. And in another surah, we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the same thing. If we open a translation, it will say the same translation. But it is a different word. It is derived from the same word, but it is a different word. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the dream of the king in the, in the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, what was the dream of the king? He saw seven skinny cows eating seven fat cows and he saw seven uh, dry grains and he saw seven uh, green grains. But basically the, the word that is mentioned is ears. It is the same word. And it is the same number also. Saba'a sanabil. But in this surah, in Surah Yusuf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Saba'a sumbulat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Saba sumbulat instead of saying Saba sanabil. And the difference that the scholars mentioned, the scholars of language mentioned between these two words, both of them are plural. Both of them are plural. They mean ears, ears. But one of them is something called Jam'ul Qillah and one of them is something called Jam'ul Kathra. One of them is something called uh, a plural of, uh, you know, great quantity, which is called Jam'ul Kathra. And another one is Jam'ul Qillah, which is a, a plural of lesser quantity. A plural of lesser quantity. And scholars mention that uh, the one that is used for uh, Jam'ul Kathra, greater quantity, is usually used for uh, things which are more than 11. More than 11, usually. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, there are three to infinity. There are three to infinity. And the one which is used for qilla is normally, seven, uh, is normally 3 to 11. The one which is used for a lot is 3 to infinity. And the one which is used for less is 3 to 11. 
So this one can be used for 3 to infinity, and this one can be used for 3 to 11. And one of the things that we notice in these two ayat is the contexts are completely different. And one of them is something where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to express the greatness and the vastness and the quantity of something. And that is the ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the vastness of the reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give for giving charity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Saba'a Sanabil. He uses Jam'ul Kathra, the plural for a great quantity, to show that this is something which it is not something limited. It is not something which is limited. But on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give a great quantity of reward. And again, the quality of that reward is not something that we can perceive in this dunya. It's not something which we can perceive in this worldly life. And the context in Surah Yusuf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about seven grains, uh, seven ears. It is a fixed number. It is something which is, you know, bound. It is not something where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to express the vastness and the immenseness of something. Now let us give another example. And this is, we'll end with this inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah and in many other surahs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses the story of Adam alayhi salam. And we all know the story of Adam alayhi salam, how Iblis, he deceived Adam alayhi salam and Adam alayhi salam was sent down to this earth. And we know, we know this story. We have all heard this when we, when we were young. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of this in Surah Al-Baqarah, in Surah Al-A'raf, in Surah Taha, and in other surahs. I'll discuss two surahs, one in Surah Al-Baqarah and another Surah Taha, wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of two very, very similar ayat. Two very, very similar ayat. However, there is one small part of that word which is different. One small part of that word which is different, which shows us the immense eloquence of the Qur'an. And that each situation, the meaning and the context is something different. And each place, it is put in the right place. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down Adam alayhi salam, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدَىٰ فَمَنْ تَبِعَ هُدَىٰيَ فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ That if uh, or when guidance comes to you from me, whoever follows my guidance, whoever follows my guidance, there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. Similarly, in Surah Taha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the same surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدَىٰ فَمَنِ اتَّبَعَ هُدَىٰيَ فَلَا يَضِلُّ وَلَا يَشْقَىٰ That when, and when guidance comes to you from me, Whoever follows my guidance, up to here, the translation is exactly the same. Up to here, the translation is exactly the same. But there's one word which is slightly different. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ تَبِعَ هُدَايَ And in Surah Taha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ اتَّبَعَ هُدَايَ اتَّبَعَ and تَبِعَ They are derived even from the same root, but they have slightly different meanings. تَبِعَ means that a person follows something. Whoever follows my guidance means whoever follows my guidance. But ittaba'a, again in the translation you will read the same thing. That whoever follows my guidance. But in the Arabic language, what it implies further is that it is something which is done with effort. That scale in the Arabic language is used to refer to something which is done with a bit of effort. Ifta'ala. Ittaba'a. So a person does follows but with a certain there is a certain level of effort implied in the in the word and then the response is different in surah al-baqarah and different in surah taha in surah taha where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala implies effort a certain level of effort allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to this by saying Fala yadillu wa la yashqa. then he will not go astray nor will he suffer and nor will he be doomed or nor will he be doomed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about misguidance, he will not be misguided, 
and he will not suffer, he will not be doomed. Basically, you know, فَلَا يَشْقَ وَلَا يَشْقَ basically means that a person does a great amount of effort or that a person uh, suffers a great deal but there is no outcome from it. There is no good outcome from it. A person just suffers without any good outcome from it. So a person will not be in this state. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising in Surah Taha where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the effort. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to it by saying فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ That there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. Nor will they grieve. Now at the beginning of Surah Taha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Taha, ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'ana li tashqa, illa tazkiratan li man yakhsha. That we have not revealed the Qur'an upon you, so that you become from the people of shaqa, from the people of shaqa. Shaqa meaning again the same thing that we mentioned, that a person does a great deal of effort, a person suffers a great deal, but without any good outcome. We have not revealed the Qur'an upon you for this. Meaning that Allah, subh uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa with a lot of things. And the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him with a lot of things, which he did not test the disbelievers with, does not mean that the Prophet ﷺ was in a state of shaqa. So this is basically the introduction to the surah. As we mentioned, the whole surah will revolve around this. In general, this surah will revolve around this. إِلَّا تَذْكِرَةً لِمَنْ يَخْشَى Except that it be a reminder for those who fear. For those who fear. Those who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned, what is the purpose? What is the purpose for this Qur'an? That it is a reminder, it is a guidance. Now the whole surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the story of Musa alayhi salam, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him and how there was a good outcome from it and how he did not suffer for nothing but rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him to grant him guidance and to grant him, uh, you know, grant him a good life in the hereafter and to grant him great rewards in the hereafter. So towards the end of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions something which is suitable to this context. He mentions in the start of the surah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made mention of something which the Prophet sallallahu was perhaps feeling, that he was making a lot of effort, that he was suffering a lot, the disbelievers were harming him a lot. At the end of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of how he makes effort. Ittaba'a hudaya. Whoever follows but you know with that extra effort with that extra exertion whoever follows my guidance then he will not be misguided he will not be misguided because as we mentioned in the beginning of the surah the purpose actual purpose of the revelation of the quran which was mentioned in the beginning of the surah was to be a reminder and a guidance for the people so and neither will he be doomed Neither will he be making this effort and be suffering all this for nothing. So subhanAllah, look at how the context suits with the meaning. Look at how the word which is used is perfectly suited to the context. Now there's many other points, there's many other uh, features that we can mention regarding the structure of the Qur'an. But we mention these points just as a taster, just so that we can remind ourselves that there's a lot to learn that we need to struggle to try and understand the Arabic language. We need to try and struggle to try and understand this guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent to us so that we can fulfill the purpose of our life in this dunya. So that we can fulfill the purpose of being in this dunya. That this is a test and not the end goal. This is a test, this is a temporary test and not the end goal. So let us try and make an effort. Let us try and be on this path. You know, it is a path. None of us here have reached the end of the path. It is a continuous path. Not me, not my father, not my brother. None of us have reached the end of knowledge. But let us try and make more effort. Let us make an intention to try and be on that path. That today we are on one level and tomorrow we can see what is the level that we have improved. We can see where we have improved. We can see where we have come forward. 
So let us try and have this intention to try and develop ourselves. And first and foremost, we should try and learn the language of the Qur'an. We should try and learn the language of the Qur'an so that we can refer back to these texts. We can refer back to have a connection, a proper connection with the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he grant us tawfiq and he grant us understanding of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he accept from us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he grant us ikhlas in all our actions, in, in all of our sayings. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he keep us on the path of Islam until our deaths. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.